All right. Good morning. morning. Thank you. It's time to nerd out. Let's do this. It's good to see you all this morning. At the outset, I have to tell you, I have an earache, and I took a Mucinex, and I just constantly hear my ear popping. So, if I can't hear you, it's not because I'm ignoring you, Uh, and if I shriek or I collapse, you know why. Let me pray for us, and then we'll get started. Father God, thank you for this lovely, beautiful day. Thank you for the space in which you have created. You yourself have made space for creatures and creation so that uh, they may enjoy you, we may enjoy you. Lord, this morning as we think about, we conclude our time um, discussing spiritual disciplines, but we think about disagreement We ask that you would give us insight, help us to see how you want us to interact and how we might do so in a way that is in keeping with where the Spirit is taking us in the community that you are forming for the future. We ask that our discussion and our, these insights would would draw us closer to you and that in turn, that we would honor and glorify you even as we approach our neighbor about contentious issues. We give you all the honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, So this morning, this is our last week together, um, talking about spiritual disciplines. And as I mentioned week one, I wanted to get a little creative um, with some work that I'm currently doing on disagreement. And what I would like to do this morning is pitch disagreement as a spiritual discipline. There might be some conceptual hurdles that we have to jump through and uh, uh, wiggle out, but um, I think it is a spiritual discipline, and it's a spiritual discipline that we need to cultivate here and now. I I begin with two epigraphs, one from Rene Descartes and one from Thomas Hobbes, which uh, they're not, um, well, I don't want to judge their hearts, but uh, they weren't necessarily the best of Christians, um, but they they do have insight here um, that I find relevant and uh, the spirit of what they're trying to articulate is a Christian spirit. That Descartes was a Catholic philosopher who um, really, really believed in the, the, the proving of truths of the mind. And um, this quote from him I just found to be uh, exceptional um, in spirit, that those who can make objections against you, we should, we should be the kind of people who would welcome objections because it's not about us, it's about the truth. And Thomas Hobbes also notes something here that's equally important uh, about being fit for society, uh, that we don't, we don't come ready-made to, to live in community and be in society, but we have to become fit. We have to discipline ourselves. And really, that's what we're talking about this morning, is that disagreement is something that doesn't come naturally. It's something that we have to learn how to do. Um, And we have to learn how to do it in community. So I should note at the outset, though, I'm not going to recite a ton of passages from Scripture. Um, The Bible is not a concordance in which we can go look in the index for disagreement and find all of the passages about disagreement. We have to have a wider lens. We have to see things that are in there that aren't necessarily named. Um, When we're we're thinking about disagreement, we've got to look at Peter and Paul. We've got to look at Jesus and Satan. We've got to look at Moses and Pharaoh. We have to look to these examples to see, is this disagreement? What are they doing? How are they interacting and exchanging? So 
most of this, most of our discussion today will be sort of philosophical, theological. I'm not trying to recite all of these passages from Scripture, but we can do that if you would like, or you can raise those and we can discuss them. Where have we been? Well, we've gone from a discussion of spiritual disciplines and what they are, and the past two weeks we have looked at meditation and fasting and feasting. We've looked at the end. What is the end of tummies? What is the end of urges and appetites? And we looked at three different ways that our tummies and appetites are malformed. We take too much, we take too little, we don't share. And we looked at fasting and feasting as a spiritual discipline, as spiritual disciplines that help us eat in celebration of God and out of concern for our neighbor. And this morning, As we look at disagreement, we're asking the question, what is dialogue for? What is interaction for? Why would we even engage in it? What's its purpose? Now, if you're having difficulty framing disagreement, and I'll get into this and try to pitch it as as most persuasively as I can, but we're, we're, do, we're sort of jumping out of my body, my mind, my med, you know, meditation, my tummy, from my body to a social body. So disagreement, as I would pitch it, disagreement is not necessarily a spiritual discipline for me. It's a spiritual discipline for us. The body. Our body. The body of Christ. So we're shifting from me and my body and all that I encompass to us and Christ's body and all that he encompasses. So we're looking at particular roles in the church, but we're also, ta- we're also looking at being the church. How do we be the church? And we're, we're shifting from personal habits to interpersonal habits in the church. And I would like to propose disagreement as a spiritual discipline that we can and should engage in to be the body of Christ. But what we're, what we're going to have to do here for a moment is to gut out any preconceived notions about what we think disagreement is. Because disagreement doesn't have to be contentious, and disagreement is more than merely saying no. There's two, there's two tendencies, it seems like, that we have in culture in this moment right now. So this is sort of undergirding my argument for why disagreement is important right now. The two tendencies are, one, countering. We look at any position skeptically. We look at any position as a competition. Even when we're in agreement with someone, we're trying to be more right. We're trying to speak more of the truth than they do. There's this countering tendency. I need to find something wrong with what you're saying. I need to find more than you're offering. There's this competitive rivalry that we seem to have, whatever the topic of discussion might be. Now, it's most perniciously demonstrated in wanting to win an argument. Even that language, winning an argument, as if it's not about the truth, it's about winning. Or we try to persuade the other person to come on our side instead of understanding where they're coming from. Now, there's nothing wrong with trying to persuade. What we're talking about here is the spiritual attitude in which we're trying to do it will do anything to get them over here. Our attitude and our orientation is one in which I'm over here, you need to be over here, and there's nothing that would draw me over to you. There's an antithetical posture, an antithesis, a counter-truth claim. Even if it is, 
you didn't tell the truth or the whole truth or nothing but the truth. So on the one hand, there's this spiritual tendency as we enter into conversations and discussions and disagreement, one in which we're ready to battle. And we enter those conversations in that way. The other tendency, uh, which is perhaps the opposite, instead of a readiness to go in and attack, there's a readiness to escape and avoid. And this is most, most clearly demonstrated in our canceling culture. We view people, not just the positions, but we view people as rivals that we need to avoid or silence so that they cannot be heard or taken seriously. It's not worth convincing them. It's worth shutting them up. And so I will spend my time and my energy Instead of trying to understand them or to persuade them, I will use my time and energy to shut them up. And so the, you see this in a concern for giving someone a platform. We cannot allow them to have a voice. Or anything that offends us, we report. Whether it's on social media or in, in, in our places of work. Wherever it might be, anything, we're looking for ways in which you could offend me so that I can cancel you. Now, higher up, it's violations of policies, lawsuits. We live in a culture that's very, very quick to file lawsuits for whatever reason it might be. We're part of a culture in which we're trying to either beat down or push away. That's the spirit, those two tendencies. That's the spirit in which we engage in conversations, it seems like, on a very, very broad um, plane. Is disagreement really at work here? I think some people would say disagreement is the problem. I actually think disagreement is not only not the problem, we don't disagree enough. We contend and we counter and we cancel, but I'm not so sure we disagree. What is disagreement? As you'll see on your sheet there, I want to tease out a few things here to help us come to a, a more robust and thicker understanding of what disagreement is. Etymologically in the Greek, disagreement comes, comes to us or our understanding through dialogue. Dialogue is speaking through. And it's not speaking through with just yourself. It's speaking through things with others. You don't get disagreement without dialogue. And you don't get agreement without dialogue. Disagreement is something that emerges in the course of dialogue. Now, superficially, we might think it's, oh, I don't agree with you, and that's disagreement. But as we'll see here in a second, that's not quite disagreement. You don't get disagreement talking to yourself. So a monologue is not going to make disagreement evident. And a variation of that, you coming to a conversation or a discussion with a conclusion already in mind is not engaging in dialogue. You don't get disagreement talking to yourself. You don't get disagreement talking to sycophants or flatterers. Those who are just going to say to you, oh, yeah, 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 you're right. You're not going to get disagreement with people who just affirm what you say. Nor do you get, nor do you get disagreement talking to people who are reticent, 
people who are not forthright, who are not truth tellers, those who, who hold back either because they are they, they're, uh, timid or a false sense of humility. They don't want to speak the truth and name it. You're not going to get disagreement from these kinds of people. And you're not going to get disagreement unless you are what you're expecting from others. And we'll get to that in here, here in a second. I would propose to you that disagreement is not non-agreement. In the same way that agreement is not merely saying yes, disagreement is not merely saying no. But it's an understanding that you and I are not on the same page. And I understand how we got there. So I would propose to you that disagreement is fundamentally about understanding. We understand where we are and why we are not on the same page. And it could be as simple as the conclusion or the position. I don't share that same view, but it also could be the way that we got there. I disagree with how you got to that conclusion. So disagreement is fundamentally about understanding. It's not merely saying no. It's not merely inhabiting the space of we're unanimous. It's understanding where we started or what we're talking about, our conclusion, our view, and the ways that we got there. There could be many reasons others do not agree with us. This is why, I mean, to reiterate, this is why it's a spiritual issue. There's many reasons people don't agree with us. It's not just cognitive. It's not just rational. There's many reasons. Like they just want to raise objections because they enjoy it. Or they want to play devil's advocate. Or they have their own doubts. They might be suspicious of our intentions. Or flat out, they might just not like us. And we're not in the realm of disagreement. In order to disagree, we have to understand each other. Let me hold off there for a second, grab some water. Any thoughts, questions? Yep. Uh, I got a thought and then maybe two questions. Yep. (laughs) <laughs> so, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll make it brief. So, uh, it, when I, when I, before I retired, I used to work with groups of people, and a lot of times you're trying to solve a problem. But I would use dialogue to say, look, we're not trying to come to a conclusion, we're not trying to uh, come to a decision. All we want to do is dialogue, and let's get truth on the table about what the issue is. So, using dialogue to understand is very helpful. And when you call that out up front, it puts everybody at ease. And we're not trying to make a decision here, so you don't have to justify your position. Let's just understand the problem. The the other thing is, though, in light of that, a lot of disagreement, you have to land somewhere. A lot of it is for the purpose of decision-making or direction-setting. And so you have to land somewhere. And uh, I don't know if you're going to address that. You don't have to address that now, but if you're going to address that later on this morning, that's, that's fine. And the last thing was, I remember R.C. Sproul did a lecture on where he talked about Hegel's thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. And R.C. Sproul's point in that is a lot of times that takes you down a a wrong path because people try to solve the two Mm -hmm. views and they synthesize it and then eventually you get further and further away from what is actually true. And I was just wondering how you reconcile that with Morning at the end. Yeah, I'm trying to connect all three. Um, I'm sorry. No, 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 it's fine. Um, I think your situation um, that you're recounting, 
I don't know if I would say that's dialogue. That's the other thing is I would want to retrieve a robust sense of dialogue. The two of us talking is not the same as speaking through things. Um, we may be talking past each other, and that's not speaking through it. And I would say, you know, we, we sort of, we've sucked the life out of dialogue. That dialogue now is, let's just talk it out. Let's just, you know, everybody share your opinion. And that's dialogue. I don't think that's dialogue. Um, I think we know that's not dialogue, too. We don't even have to look at it etymologically. It's just we know that we're not, we're not engaging in conversation. You're just saying what you think and what you feel, and I'm saying what I think and what I feel, and that's it. So in that scenario, I would question whether or not that was dialogue. Merely sharing your view is not speaking through things. Um, let me jump to three, and then I might have to, you might have to tell me again what two is. Three. Um, yeah, you're, you're right. I, I would be, R.C. Sproul, R.C. Sproul is right um, in this sense. I think that we typically try to stifle disagreement because we're worried it will bring disunity. And I actually think it brings unity. I actually think that when it's done well, it registers on such an interpersonal plane um, that we value the truth. We value the intimacy of being able to share our convictions and another person respecting it. Um, disagreement does not have to divide. Um, and so you could have someone who's constantly you know, up in front of the room or you know, in, the, in the board office or whatever, and uh, um, you know, who's trying to like, okay, everybody share, you, know, you all shared your opinions, okay, all right, all right, let's not, you know, they're stifling what might come to the surface, which is something far more personal that I want to share. And disagreement isn't trying to package those relationships. And um, I just keep thinking of contentious. But you know, those contentious arguments, it's just trying to handle them in the right way. It's not trying to dismiss them. And it's not trying to say, hey, let's only focus on the things that we agree on. I think that's problematic. Does that answer one in, one in three? What was two again? Two is just that a lot of times organizations are at, at in, they're having disagreements. And a lot of that, the, the resolution of that disagreement will determine a direction that that organization oh, yeah. will take. Mm -hmm. and, and again, uh, you have to land somewhere. And usually it's on one side of the equation. Sometimes it's a compromise, mm -hmm. sometimes it's not. Yeah, now I remember what I was thinking about that. And I, go ahead. I'm just saying, you, if you're going to address that later on in your lecture, you're going to have to address that. Well, I'll, I'll address it right now. Um, I, I also think too highly of agreement and disagreement to make it about doing something. That's the other thing I think we have to disabuse ourselves of. Disagreement and agreement are about understanding. And that's good enough. That's it. We don't need to agree to do something. And we don't need to disagree in order to move forward. I think agreeing and disagreeing are themselves progress. You know, we have, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know what that is, but we have a utilitarian understanding of understanding. Right? We have to, we have to understand something so that then we can go on and do something. Um, Understanding is good in and of itself, and that's progress. I mean, that's, that's part of the argument here is like, we don't need to disagree. I, I would argue we need to disagree, period. We need to learn how to disagree, period. But we don't need to learn. I, I want to argue that disagreement 
is building up the body. But I wouldn't say that we need to disagree in order to build up the body. I would just say we need to disagree, and we need to learn how to disagree. And oh, by the way, disagreement builds up, builds up the body if it's done well. Does that answer your, yeah. Okay, so I think we typically confuse disagreement with what I would call disagreement's close cousins. On the one hand, disagreement is not non-agreement. It's not merely saying no. But if we look at these close cousins, we can see how sometimes we conflate disagreement with these other movements of the mind. So on the one hand, you have dissent. Dissent has to do with conclusion. So I would just argue each of these, each of these close cousins only takes one piece of the pie. Disagreement is the whole thing. So disagreement could involve dissent, but it's not exclusively or, or singularly dissent. Dissent has to do with conclusions. Where one begins or how one gets to the conclusion doesn't, doesn't really play any part in the dissent. It's, oh, you have that view? Nope, not me. Right, so dissent focuses on the end or the conclusion or the position and whether or not I oppose that final view. So it doesn't matter how you got there. It doesn't matter where you're starting from. It's just you used a trigger word. I don't agree with you. Or you hold a position and it might be nuanced. I don't care. I do not hold that position. I do not hold that conclusion. I would propose that disagreement is not merely dissent. Disagreement is also not merely disputation, to dispute something. Oftentimes, dis disputation has to do with little elements in an argument. I dispute your starting point, or how you interpreted the data, or the judgments you made along the way. That's faulty reasoning. That's, fuzz, that, that, that's fuzzy, fuzzy logic. I dispute something. So if an argument is spread out in a linear fashion, I look at something and I say, oop, you made a mistake there. That's, a, that, that's what it means to dispute. You dispute something, not necessarily the conclusion. And so dissent focuses on the end. Disputation focuses on something in the middle. Now, debate is something entirely different, an entirely different way of interacting in community. Debate has to do with the hearing of other, the opinions of others so that I can rebut them, so I can refuse them. You come to a, de you come to a debate anticipating being against it or finding fault in it. Already, I would say, disagreement, your, your, spiritual, your spiritual posture is entirely different. It's not walking into, it's not walking into a discussion or a conversation in order to prove them wrong. Nor is disagreement trying to prove them wrong. It's trying to understand them and where they're coming from. So debate has to do with this whole public setting in which we respond to the opinions of others and we try to debunk them or, or disprove them. Now, debate could presuppose disagreement. We know he's coming from this perspective. We know she's coming from that perspective. We're going to bring them together. There's going to be disagreement. Right. So debate could presuppose disagreement. But not all debates are, in fact, disagreements. Again, if it's about understanding, I can refute somebody's argument without understanding them. I could focus on the conclusion. But disagreement wants to understand, where are you coming from? How did you get there? Why do you want to be there? That's what understanding involves. And to demur, this is merely just a, again, I would say it's a spiritual posture. You're not ready to agree. 
you're not ready to make a conclusion that I don't really know what I know. So you could still have doubts and objections. So there's a different, there's several phenomena here to not agree, to disagree. And I, I don't know, I don't know where I'm at right now. I don't know whether or not I agree. I don't know whether or not I disagree. I just don't know right now. So you still have doubts or objections, and everything hasn't been addressed in a satisfactory way. And you don't want to admit that they're wrong, nor do you want to admit that they're right. Is this, is this making sense? Thoughts? I, mean, I wandered in here late this morning, so, <laughs> if, so it's your fault. If, if you Yes, yes and no. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm saying uh, brothers and sisters in Christ who, who believe in kind of a general, we, we generally believe in the same thing. Or are you talking about disagreements between people who we don't share the same worldview with? Or? I'm saying both. Uh, I feel like they're, they're so different. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, not, they're not so different but there's variation, obviously, right? You and I agree with respect to probably core doctrines, but then again, we may not. But doesn't that kind of bind us together, in a sense, being brothers and sisters in Christ, that we disagree in a different way than we would in atheists? I think I understand where you're going. I don't. The, the, the disagreement is not what, what binds us. I would say the Holy Spirit is what binds us. Does disagreement push us in the trail of the Holy Spirit and leading us towards greater unity? Yeah, I think so. That's why I'm pitching it as a spiritual discipline. Uh, but I would all, I, one of the things that I was thinking about as I was, as I was preparing this is, um, do I think that there will be disagreement in heaven? I think so. If I still have the same eyes in everlasting life, and I still have the same mind, and I have to use this, and I have to use this, and it's oriented by this, I'm going to have to make judgments. I'm going to have to make conclusions. Um, now, one, one, second, one second before I forget. I think in, within the Christian tradition, we talk about the beatific vision, this vision of blessedness, which I think in the context here, someone might say, I don't know if we actually just always see and understand things, or we will see things and understand them in a different way, like an angel. I think we're still going to be human beings. We will be glorified human beings, but I think we'll still have eyes and minds and hearts, and we'll have to use them. And we'll still have to interpret things, and things will mean things to us individually. All that to say, I think there's room in all of that for disagreement to occur. I just don't see things that way. Yes, he's king. Yes, I see him in front of me. But you're focused on his garb, and I'm looking at a sandal. You know what I mean? There, there, there's, there's all sorts of judgments, all sorts of, of reasonings and interpretations that there's room. I think, I, I wonder if there's room for disagreement. But the way that you evaluate information in heaven will be different because you'll be glorified, and, and therefore... There won't be sadness, right? We're told that. Um, so I'm not sure. I'd have to demur. <laughs> <laughs> what, what makes you say that we will evaluate differently? Uh, because we'll be in a perfected state. Yes. And so what is it? 
Let me give you an example. Yeah. Okay. I used to teach a class. I used to teach journalism at CMU. I had a class that I called Why People Lie. Okay. <laughs> the premise being a reformed premise, but I never said it on that basis, which is that all people lie. Accept that as a journalist. Your, your job is to get to the best obtainable version of the truth. <laughs> you will never arrive at full truth. What you're trying to reach is the best obtainable version of the truth. And so in that course, in that, in that journey, you are seeking to evaluate the, the degrees of relative untruth that are, that are passed to you by sources. Sources that are flawed. Sources, sources that have bias. Sources that have uh, perhaps avarice. Perhaps jealousy. Perhaps terrible motives. And so the way you do that, and, and when I look at your discipline, our disagreement, your four things there, uh, that's perfect. I wish I had had that so clearly articulated when I was teaching that class. When you listen carefully, you articulate clearly, you understand critically, you judge constructively, because as you're taking information, you're doing all those things to determine the ex not whether a person's lying, but the extent to which they are lying. Right? Uh, I mean, I know that may sound like a very, very cynical view of humanity, but I think all reform theology is gets you there. Amen. And so, um, so to answer your, to go back to your question, I don't think it's just about. It, it, it's actually a discipline that applies very, very broadly in terms of how you evaluate the world around you and the things that you encounter that you disagree with. And I'm always surprised that people don't do that with information that conflicts potentially with how they're thinking about a particular subject. Because all people lie. They do. I know that sounds funny, but they do. Every person in this room lies, and lies routinely. That's why we have forgiveness. Of course, that's why we have forgiveness. Yeah. But it, it, it gives you a different view in terms of how you view information that's presented to you. I have two thoughts. One, one is, as I'm thinking through this, it, it sort of chastens. I think that the disagreement is not what unites us, but disagreement could contribute to that unity. And I don't, I don't think of disagreement with the world and disagreement in the church as two separate things or different things. It's a scale. Um, and one of the reasons I would say it's a scale is because just because we're in the church doesn't mean that we don't have worldly minds. So even though you and I might agree on core doctrines and these sorts of things, um, our starting points might be very different. I mean, not all who are in the church are Christians or think Christianly. So we're not only engaging, we're not only engaging the world With, with its secular presuppositions and principles, we're also engaging Christians with their secular presuppositions and principles. That's my first thought. My second thought is, you know, it does chasten or make me wonder about how much we really, this is off on a tangent, I'm sorry, footnote, how much we really think evangelism through through rational arguments, is effective. We're not only dealing with hearts and stubborn, obstinate hearts. We're also dealing with people who don't know their starting point. So in order to disagree, you and I have to be aware of where we're coming from and what's motivating us. 
And there's a lot of unbelievers and believers who don't know where they're coming from or don't, are unaware of what they truly believe. So there's a lot involved in disagreement that it's not, oh, it's so easy to do in the church, but it's difficult to do outside of the church. I think it's difficult to do everywhere. Does that answer your question, Andrew? Well, I agree. It's, it's difficult to do in the church, even with fellow brothers and sisters. Um, I guess I think we it's a different... I, I think we have to be careful about how we engage and perhaps might be manipulated by or uh, go down a rabbit hole secular arguments. Um, whereas in within the church, we're dealing with something where it, I, when you're talking about disagreements, I feel like you're opening yourself up as a family to disagreement in a, in a personal sense that I think makes you vulnerable. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to do that right. yeah. with everyone? Yeah, I mean, that would be one of the things, too, like whether it's disagreement or dialogue, that's something else here that I've talked about with respect to disagreement. You do not, you, it's, it's, imp, it's imprudent to try to disagree with everyone. It's also imprudent to try to dialogue with everyone. There's some people who aren't worth your time. Not because you're better, but they don't, they don't really want it. Um, and so you need to be the kind of discerning, rational human being who can say, this person is not going to be convinced. It's a waste of my time. Yeah, Bob. I think um, the attitude is the difference. Um, this excellent working definition and these, and these four components Understanding, which it is, when I was arguing in a courtroom and I wanted to know everything about the other party's case, it was to, for the purpose of winning. Mm -hmm. But Christians, that, that's not the purpose of understanding. Mm -hmm. But I think that attitude, uh, if we're talking about disagreements between brothers and sisters, Christ, there is guidance in the scriptures because if we have the attitude that we submit to one another and that we're to think of others more highly than ourselves, then only with that attitude can we go do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I would understand, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. It, it is, this is why I would frame it, going back to week one and week two, this is why I would frame it in terms of a spiritual discipline. It, it's not just here, it's here. And it's how you position and posture yourself to enter into a dialogue with someone else. And you have to discipline yourself to enter in that way or you have to come under the spirit in order to be able to enter in that way? Um, I, 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 this is kind of how I look at it. I have, when it comes to like, arguments and debates, I have a neighbor that I've, that I've shared with, shared the gospel with before. And uh, we got into this stupid sort of discussion about um, something not consequential, it was about hunting, right? And art, this archery hunting, uh, it's, it's more challenging. Rifle hunting is cheating. It's too easy. And we were debating. It's like it was stupid. And what was funny was, what was really funny was, we both changed our point of view within two weeks. We changed our opinions and we agreed with each other. And so I made a point of saying, to my neighbor, I just checked in, but like, we both changed our point of view on what we were arguing about. He's like, yeah. And I said, okay. And the reason I did that was because when it comes to evangelism, I think. If, if, if you're willing to um, say, look, I was, I've changed my point of view on an opinion that you held, I think the value is when you do get into discussions about spiritual things that they know that, that you're willing to listen, you know, that, mm -hmm. that, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, one 
thing I would say, I think to take it back off what Andrew said, I think a big part of what stance is who you engage with and how, at least personally outside of the church, is who made the first move. If I find a man I know doesn't find doesn't believe in Christ and I put him in a corner and say, We need to get you to an understanding of God, immediately I'm the attacker and he's the defender, and that puts his defense up. Whereas what I found at least in my conversations with my couple of atheist coworkers is that you attempt to follow all the other disciplines you've laid out in the weeks prior. And what you do is, by developing those disciplines and becoming an exemplar of how you should behave, people are drawn in to a conversation saying, you're not as ticked off at management as you should be. And you go, well, here's why. And I found a lot more success when you're neither the defender nor the attacker, you're the envoy. You're the guy that they come to the middle of the field and say, let's have a conversation about the battle going on around us. Um, so I think that probably I've seen, with the past couple of years with COVID, we've seen a lot of aggressors and defenders. And you get stuck in a conversation where someone has to win. Um, and I, I think I've been trying to learn how to practice silence specifically a little more so that when they start talking to you, even if you have an opposing viewpoint, you're not attacking them. You are rounding out their view. Yeah. I, I, I also think, you know, there, there's something, I don't, know how, I don't know what to identify, but there's also something that um, makes it difficult for us to agree and disagree because we take offense at, uh, you know, oh, that's not, that's not an airtight thought or argument. Um, I remember uh, something that Socrates said that Plato wrote in the Gorgias about, the greatest benefaction you can have in your life is someone who will rid you of nonsense. I mean, why, why wouldn't we want, if we're wrong, why wouldn't we welcome somebody who proves us wrong? Um, and as Christians, most of all, spiritually, right, we know who has the truth. I think culturally we've coded disagreement as a, such a bad thing. Like even if you think about the term agreeable or disagreeable, like that's that's awful over there. It's so disagreeable means awful in our terminology that we've kind of lost the idea that like even preferences, people have different preferences than you do, and that's okay. You can disagree on like the minor things, and. The point is, is you can both present why you like a certain thing or dislike a certain thing, and if you can walk away from the situation and still be friends, then you've had a disagreement and you've had it properly. The idea that a disagreement is bad comes from the idea that we have to be right, and there's a fear of being wrong mm -hmm. in our culture, and unfortunately, it brings up the whole idea of being contentious in arguments. If you're coming to an argument being like, I have to, I have to, I have to hold my ground and maintain my case, and you're afraid of being challenged, then you're not really having a disagreement, you're having an argument. I mean, it, that's just, an argument is a type of disagreement, but you're not learning to disagree. The, the idea is, it comes back to the whole passage where Paul talks about the, uh, the brother that can't eat the, the meat, the brother that can't eat the meat. Mm -hmm. You're both coming to a conclusion, and whether or not one of you is right or wrong isn't really what's important in that situation. You need to, well, as a Christian, the idea is coming to the situation and learning to view the other person in love, and even if they don't agree with you at the end of the day, and even if they aren't able to hear your side of the story, walking away in love too. So walking learning, away what? Walking away in love too, and mm. still approaching it in kindness, and not contention, and not letting it devolve into anger, and I think that's why you're bringing it up to spiritual discipline, is learning to not always agree with other people, and yet still act in brotherly love. Mm -hmm. Yep, I would, I'm sensitive to our time now, um, but let me just make a few concluding remarks. And if you have any questions about the rest of the, the outline here, I'm happy to chat about that anytime. Um, but I, would, I, I, th I do think disagreement is a spiritual discipline in that it is a correcting of our posture in interrelating with others and dialoguing. 
And if there, if there was a more urgent time in the history of the church for disagreement, it would be now. Um, we demonize and divide. Uh, we don't dialogue and we don't disagree. And if anything, Christians should be experts, if you will, at disagreement because we know what runs deeper and we seek to understand um, creation, God, others, our neighbor. Um, and so I would just propose to you, practice disagreement. Make disagreement something you seek out in these ways. Don't avoid your neighbor. Don't circumvent those conversations. Uh, get to the bottom of it and be united in a way that transcends your different, differing views. Let me pray for us, and we'll head upstairs and worship our Lord and Savior. Jesus, thank you for this time. Thank you for this beautiful day. Uh, Lord, we want to orient our lives toward you and everything that we do, including our interaction with our neighbor. Lord, help us to disagree well. Help us to disagree better. Help us to discipline, um, help us to discipline our interactions that we would not be afraid of seeking the truth, that we would not be afraid of pursuing understanding, even though we have an intuition or a clue that we may not reach the same conclusion as our neighbor. Give us the security and Holy Spirit, give us the comfort and peace in knowing that uh, you are the Lord of the truth. You are the way, the truth, and the life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you all for six weeks. It was wonderful. I appreciate it.